Greetings one more Wednesday evening to all my father's children. Really do greet us all in the exalted, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to another in our Bible study series. We are continuing on the theme, Walking in the Word. Um, we, over the last two weeks, I believe, have looked at the very important fact that the words of Almighty God are awesome. They supersede everything else. In fact, we started out and we examined Psalm 138 and about verse 2, where it indicates to us that God magnifies his word above all his very name. We need to understand, I cannot overemphasize, we cannot make it uh, any clearer to us as children of God, as saints of the Most High God, that the words of Almighty God must take a place of prominence in our lives. The words of God must be preeminent, must be at a place of top priority in our lives if we are going to live wholesome, if we are going to be overcoming Christians, we need to understand and we need to walk in the words of Almighty God. When God says a thing, when God outlines a principle, he means what he says. He wants us to walk in the word. He wants us to abide by the things that he has set out. And God is very strategic. God is very deliberate. And when he therefore outlines in his words how we must proceed with a particular matter, how we must proceed along a certain path, there are reasons why God uh, puts it the way that he has. And all that we need to do as children of God is to abide in and abide by the words of Almighty God. And so we have been looking at how valuable, at how precious the words of God are. Because if we uh, become foolish enough, and sometimes we find ourselves in that foolish place where we bypass the words of Almighty God, where we try to circumvent the things that he has outlined to us to guide our steps. We have gone awry of it. And if we are foolish enough to continue in that path, our end will not be good. It will not be pretty at all. And it doesn't matter that we once were saved or there was a time in the 1960s or the 70s or the 80s or even a year ago. It doesn't matter that we received the plan of salvation. What is important is that we recognize that this salvation uh, experience that we have places us in a race. And what is important is for us to run this race with patience. Yes, uh, there will be times when we miss. There will be times, we said, when we, for whatever reason, try to go around the world, but we'll be foolish to continue in that path. The words of God are there to guide us, to lead us, uh, to, to, to take us exactly to that place where God wants us to be. And so it is important that the child of God the, the, the serious saint takes seriously the things that are contained in this book. All scriptures we said before are given 
by inspiration of God. And it therefore behoves us to examine the scriptures carefully. Examine the scriptures regularly. Examine the scriptures passionately. Examine the scriptures with a desire to know. And then when we know, we move into action so that we can find ourselves walking in the word. It is very important. We illustrated the importance of the scriptures by looking at, I believe it was two scenarios in scriptures. And they were not popular, but they are there. And for some folks, it is the first that they are seeing scriptures like these and scriptures like these that bring out a particular point. And the point was being brought out by or referencing these two scriptures is that when we fail to follow the word, when we fail to walk in the word, we always end up on a path because make no mistake about it, we are on a journey and that journey will allow us or allows us to walk in a particular direction. God gives us his word to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So as we walk, if we walk in the word, we are walking in the path of righteousness in the way that God will have us to go. If we devalue, however, the words of Almighty God, we will still be walking. But the question now arises, where exactly are we going? Because we're going to be walking. We have to be walking because all of us are on a journey. And it is therefore important that we use the word to guide us so that we are on the right path. We are walking along the right route. We are going on the right avenue. So we end at the right destination. And the word of God is what is going to be our guiding light. Saints of the Most High God, Christians, all my father's children, it is vitally important that we recognize how crucial, how necessary, how important it is to stay, to abide in the word. We looked in Exodus in 32, chapter 32 and chapter 33, and we saw where God gave his word. He gave some things in the law which is his word, and said to the people, this is how I want you to walk. This way is the way that I require of you as my people that I have chosen. This is the way that I would want you to worship me. This is the way that I would want you, the people that I have chosen for myself, the people that I have separated from the the nations of the earth this is how I would want you to conduct yourself to deport yourself to organize yourself and he gave them his word and so long as they walked in the word they were guided they were led they were fed, they were protected, they, they, they had the presence of Almighty God with them. God was proud and happy to call them his people, my people. But notice what happened when we read into Exodus 32, Exodus 33. We find a situation where they started to veer away from the word. And what happened to Israel then, who were his people, happens to people today who are called to be saints. Once we devalue, undervalue the importance of the word of God in our lives and the fact that we must walk 
in the word, we set ourselves up to accept anything and then be deceived into believing that the things that we are accepting as right is in fact right. When according to the word of God, they are far from what God wants. But because we become deceived, because we are not walking in the word. And I'm going to be looking at a particular scripture and going along a certain path this evening, even for a short while, to reinforce the point that I am making that the word is important because the word is so important the adversary our adversary the devil is going to do everything to cause the child of God to not read to not study to not appreciate and to not walk in the word and we better <coughs> look out for this particular attack and strategy of Satan he is out for you he is out for me and I cannot state it any clearer children of the most high God I cannot make it any more potent to my father's children how crucial it is that we understand and that we embrace the fact that this word, this book, with the things that are contained therein, represents the map that will take us to that place where all of us ultimately want to be. And so the children of Israel rebelled at a particular point because they allowed the adversary, the devil, who was at work then, and that same spirit of deception operates today because we are still called to be saints. We are still people of the Most High God. And I, I, I am urging us, yes, saints of God, I am imploring us that we must be vigilant, we must be wise, we must take steps to protect ourselves, we must take steps to fight, to be on the offensive, so that we can be overcomers. And the Bible outlines to us the word of God, gives us the remedy, the, the way to operate so that we are victorious, we are constantly overcoming, and I want to make this point clear, even in a, a teaching session like this, that all of us that names the name of Jesus Christ, we are overcomers. We must and can all overcome. But it is important that we understand that the things that will give us the energy and the drive and the wherewithal to overcome comes when we begin to seriously walk in the word. We made a point that those folks still were worshipping in Exodus 32 and 33. They still were worshipping, but they were worshipping not the God of heaven. They were still having a feast Unto the capital L-O-R-D. Although God had rejected them based on their form of worship. Which was according to the word that he gave them. So they were worshipping their way. They were at an altar that was their, their altar, their way. And they were singing and making noise worshipping noise so to speak but their way and the bible tells us that god literally disowned them because when moses came down and stopped them god said to moses 
while he was coming down or while he was there with God, said, listen what your people is doing. Listen to your people, Moses, who you brought out of the land of Egypt. And we made the point that God disowned them. He said, the people are your people. Prior to that, it was my people. No, he said, they are your people. And we need to be clear, saints of God, that while we are going about doing things our way, because we have put aside his word, we need to be careful that God don't disown us as we are there just going through the motion. Because it is possible to be going through the motion and any child of God who do not take the word of God seriously, any saint anywhere that treats lightly with the words of Almighty God, it is just a matter of time before they go astray. God is going to walk with us. God is going to guide us. God is going to lead us. But there comes a time if we willfully walk away from the word, walk out of the word, we then walk on our own. There will not be that sense of protection. There will not be that sense that will keep us in a certain trajectory because we choose to walk outside of the word. The word is everything. The word means everything to Almighty God. When he gives his word, he puts his sovereignty, so to speak, on the line. God is sovereign. There is nobody that can direct him. There is nobody that can give him counsel. And so he is fully in charge so that when he speaks, must happen so he gives a heavy waiting to his word just as we said earlier his word he magnifies above his name and we cannot state to you how important and potent and powerful and valuable the name of our god is yet he honors his word i i i say it again take the words that come from the mouth of Almighty God seriously. Take the words that he has taken the time to put into this book and put them together into what we call the Bible. Take it seriously. The child of God must know that if we are going to make it, there must be fellowship, which is communion in prayer and, and fasting and, and just reaching out after God. And we must understand also what he requires of us and then walk in what he wants. Walk where he wants us to walk and do it and rejoice as we do it. It cannot be overemphasized. We also referenced a scripture in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 22, with Balaam and Balak. And we made the point, and I am reinforcing this because it is so important. It is important that we understand, it is important that we recognize that when God gives his word, it, it is his word. When God gives a particular direction, he requires us to walk in that particular way. When God says yea, it means yea. And when God says nay, it means nay. He has a reason. As I said before, he is very strategic. He is very deliberate. If God said don't do this, it's not just because he is God and he, I just say anything I want to say and you have to do it. No, he doesn't need to do that to show his sovereignty and his might. No, no, no. Not the God that we serve. When God tells us not to do a particular thing or to walk a particular way, he does that simply because it is in our best interest. Not his, but our best interest because if we do a, a particular thing and go overboard it can affect our physical health it can affect our emotional health it can affect our mental health it can affect our spiritual health god knows best god sees way ahead and so just as how he is he gives his word for us to walk in it because when we walk in it it protects us 
It keeps us from harm. It keeps us from danger. And it takes us where he wants us to be. It is in our interest, saints of God, that we walk in the word. Yes, it is. And so he spoke in Numbers 22. And what did we see there? God said to the prophet Balaam, when some men came to him from Balak, the king of Moab, telling him that the king of Moab wanted him, the prophet, to curse the children of Israel. God said to the prophet in the night when he went to seek the Lord, if he should go with them, God said, don't go. Brethren, when God in his word give instruction, they are to be followed. Yes? When God in his word gives us guidance, we must walk with the counsel that comes from his word. And that goes without saying every time. The folly of men is that we believe that we know more than God. And we allow ourselves many times to be intimidated firstly and then to be deceived by the devil. And his strategies, we will see very shortly, are always along a certain path, along a certain road. He goes with a certain trajectory every time. And guess what? He will always do that because it always works for him. And it is the word that will bring to our attention. It is the word that will bring to the forefront of our living for God. So that we can know, so that we can understand exactly how to overcome every attack attack of the devil it's very important that we understand and because of how valuable how important this word is one of the strategies of satan in fighting against the people of god is to cause our minds to be crowded out with everything else is to cause our hearts to be crowded out with everything else so that we do not have a chance to read and to digest and to take in the word of God and to walk therein. It is a strategy of the devil to cause the people of God not to read the word, not to love the word, not to, you know, I have always wondered when it comes to prayer meeting and Bible study, the two things together that can make any Christian catapult to great heights, the two things together that will cause a child of God to mature and to advance in God. It is those two things that we do the least, that we, we, we allow ourselves to be conned into believing that we can proceed and we can advance and we can mature. When it comes to the child of God, when it comes to the house of God, when it comes to the church of the living God, we don't advance based on seniority. An experience as it is in the secular work. No, no, no. We advance and we mature by virtue of our adherence to some basic fundamental tenets of this Christian pathway. And fundamentally, we must be people of prayer and we must be people of the word. And we are dealing in these studies with the word, walking in the word. We cannot advance. We cannot be the kind of people that God wants us to be if we are not men and women of the word. I don't care 
who you are. I don't care who I, I am. It, do, it doesn't matter who we are. We cannot advance. And any Christian, any child of God, you show me the child of God that don't read and study and embrace and apply and live the word. And I'll show you a child of God, no matter how they are dressed up, no matter how they are seemingly advancing. I will show you a child of God who is living in pretense. The days of his life. The days of her life. You will be a great pretender. Because no child of God can advance without loving, embracing, and walking in the word. Doesn't matter who you are. And I say that without any fear or favor. It is important that we Get the fact and understand the fundamental principle that the word is what feed us and feed our spiritual man. Man does not live by bread alone. For the man that we speak about is this physical man. If he is going to be strong, if he is going to be energetic, if he is going to be viable, he has to eat. You've got to have your protein, you've got to have your vitamins, you've got to have the minerals, you've got to... And everything is extracted from the food that we eat. The day that we stop eating and if we decide for one year we are not going to eat anything, we will die. Apart from the time when we withdraw ourselves to fast and to seek the face of the Lord and God honors that... And God placed that within the scope of our human existence for men to withdraw, to fast and pray and seek his face. So fasting for a day or two or ten or twenty or thirty won't kill a man when they are doing that. Particularly when they are doing that in honor of the great God of heaven. But allow folks to go on what they call hunger strikes. And you will that if they abstain from food for an extended period, they will die. We cannot live in this natural human state without food. It is what keeps us alive. It is what sustains us. The spiritual man likewise have to live because what you're seeing here is just flesh. What you're seeing here is dirt in a form. And the day that this flesh dies and goes in the grave, it rotten, it goes right back to the dust. So you seeing me here now, this is just the physical man, but there is the inner man. There is the spirit man. And that spirit that we all have, that inner man that you cannot see, that I cannot see, has to be fed. And... The food that we eat to give strength and energy to the physical man does nothing for the spiritual man. If we are going to feed the spiritual man in terms of food, in terms of bread, which is food, it must come from the word of God. And it is therefore on that basis that I am making a, an emphatic statement that folks are in the church today that are anemic, that are weak, that are malnourished, that are starving. And it is not because food isn't on the table, but they have decided not to eat. It does not matter who you are. If we are not walking in the word, we are going to be malnourished. And some folks who we have seen departing from the faith, that is the, their death spiritually because they starved to death because they were not eating. They were not eating from the bread of life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Almighty God. What comes out of the mouth of God? His words. And those words are contained here. And if we are going to live, we are going to have to live in this word. If we are going to survive, we are going to survive. Because we are eating. 
from his word. And we get our spiritual minerals, we get our spiritual vitamins, we get our spiritual uh, proteins and carbohydrates and everything that we will need to advance as a child of God. We get it from the word. You and I must be walking in the word. Yes? Very important. And so grasp that. Hold on to that. You cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Almighty God. This is the Bible. Remember, recall when Jesus was in the wilderness after he had completed his time of fasting and prayer. Yes, he was gearing up to go out into ministry. Yes, his ministry was about to take on that uh, push that will, would have carried him right down to his death for him to accomplish what he came here for. And after he did his days in the wilderness, he was afterwards hungry. 40 days, 40 nights. And he was now hungry. And Satan came to him as how he is going to come to all of us. Brethren, I am telling us, uh, I, this is not just doing something because of Bible study. This is not just putting some things together to provide information for us. This is straight word that has everything to do and to affect and impact our walk with God, our Christian walk. This has everything to do with life and death. The adversary is going to come and he's going to try you every way. He's going to come from different direction. He's going to come with different things because he knows the word. He knows the power and the potency of the word. And he is therefore going to do everything either to trip you up with the word because he believes you don't know it. And if you don't know it, see it and mark my word. Take what I'm saying. He will use this word and trip you up. And so it is important. He said to Jesus, uh, take the stone and turn them into bread. And Jesus had to use a word and tell him that man shall not live by bread alone. And every one of the temptations that Satan came to Jesus with. It was a word that he used from the book to address and to counter the temptations of the devil. Brothers and sisters, if you do not know the word, you will have nothing to pull and to be a counter to the temptations of the devil. And this is why this is the reason why so many have fallen this is the reason why so many have gone astray they did not have inside of them the word for the holy ghost to use to pull to counter what it is that satan came with and so brothers and sisters this book the words contained in it must be our guide, must be our light, must be the basis of our walking with God, must be the foundation upon which we stand. How can we have a, an equipment? How can we have some Beautiful, sophisticated equipment to operate. Brand new, we got it. And it didn't come with a manual of procedure to show us how to operate it. If we buy a phone, a simple phone, and it comes in a box, and somewhere in that box, we take out a little manual, and it shows you how to put the battery in, it shows you where to put the headphone, it comes with the headphone, and it shows you everything. Snap, snap, put it together, follow the manual, 
and everything is all right. We are in the church. We have come into this salvation, brand new experience. And God now gives us the operating manual. And we come in glad, get the manual, put it down, and still want the thing to work. It is not going to work. And folks who are in the church pretending it is full time now that we stop the pretense. It is full time now that we understand and here's what i'm saying accept this because it is true we know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood we know that but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places we know we wrestle against demonic forces at different ranks and different levels we know that I am telling you tonight, saints of God, that there is a warfare going on right now. And I have seen some things, not just in the natural, but in the spiritual, in the spirit. And I am telling us that there is a war raging right now. The adversary has a knock for how things may flow because of certain signals that he gets and while he cannot know the future because he's not god and only god alone knows the future he listens to the drum beats and he look at activities and he observe where prayer is taking place and he observe where saints are getting serious and are seeking the face of god because he knows People who are called by my name will seek my face and humble themselves and turn from their wicked way and pray. And he knows some things. And he knows when people start to do it, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And he knows. And when he starts to sense that certain things are coming because he sees the prayer he sees the sacrifices he sees the the, the the time of repentance he sees the time of consecration he knows that as a natural consequence of that there is going to be movement in the heavenlies so he knows when things will come he knows when things are about to happen so anytime that the devil sense and, and recognize that a change is coming, that something great is going to happen. Mark you, did you know that when Jesus, before he came, Satan knew that something great was going to happen with the coming of this child? Yes. And that's why he did everything to cause Herod to want to kill this child he knew that the words went out the prophecy went out that a king was going to be born that the king of the jews was coming the prophecies went out wise men came from the east searching for him because they knew from scriptures that this person that was going to be born in bethlehem of judea was going to be the great king that sat upon the throne of David. So they knew and the words were there and the prophecy was out. And once Satan picks up on that, he is going to do everything to abort, to stop the thing from happening. And so he attempted to take the life of Jesus from, he was a baby. In fact, at, one, at, a, at a point, the parents along with Jesus had to flee from out of Israel and go to hide in the land of Egypt until the threat was passed. And God miraculously made provision for them to leave without being caught. But the fact is Satan always knows, he senses that something great is about to be unleashed something great is about to happen in your life and then he moves at you the individual or he moves at you the church as a corporate body and he tries to 
hijack and to abort what it is that is coming to be birthed in your life as an individual or in the life of the church of the living God. But it is important that we understand that principle and that strategy of Satan. He is going to always attack. And I am submitting to the church tonight that one of the means, one of the ways that he uses to attack the people of God is to divert our attention from focusing on the word, in the word, and divert our attention to other things, to everything else. Have you ever wondered, saint of God, how when you go to school, you can sit up in that class and learn what you need to learn so that when the time for exams come, you can ace those exams? Have you ever sat in a class that you love for those that are science based and you love physics you will sit in a physics class sometimes you don't even have to take notes because you love the subject so much and you follow that teacher from start to finish and you do that every week or whenever you have class have you ever wondered how when those for those that love the social sciences when you go into that econ class you are following the teacher when you get that big thick econ book you read it from cover to cover you underline the things that jumped at you, you underline the, 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 the principles and the theories that you believe you will use later on. And you therefore study the book and you can talk about matters economically. You can talk about macroeconomics and microeconomics and you become uh, versed in all the areas of economics. How? Because you are so interested that you read and you study and you can relate it anywhere. Whether it's those that love physics or those that love economics or anything else for that matter. But have you ever wondered how when it comes to the child of God and the word of God which means more than a physics book, we can't pick it up? Have we ever wondered how on a Sunday we are coerced? To turn in our Bibles to a particular scripture. In fact, probably it's the only time that some folks turn to a scripture. And God bless. Corona has come. We only come once every month now. So it's not even once a week again. For some folks, it's once a month. But have we ever wondered how we can open our Bible? Has it ever happened to you, saint of God, that you take up the book and it's a struggle to read three verses? Yet on a Sunday, we can buy a gleaner and we can, we can turn to the, the death announcement column. Because some people tell me that's where they go first. And they look at every face and they read every name and look at the, the date that they're born and the date that they died. And which church I'm going to be buried at for, for four, five, six pages. And they do that meticulous Sunday after Sunday. Have you ever gotten your Sunday gleaner and you take out the classified section and you look for house to rent or to buy one little block by block by block by block or for those that want a car go to the classified auto section and you go car by car by car by car and spend hours going through that paper but turn to the word of God God who made the heavens and the earth God who is sovereign God who made us to serve him and have placed in these in this book, the words of eternal life. And have said to us, here it is. And we have taken it. And then we we'll put it down. And eternal life is under our bed. Eternal life is in the bookshelf, never come out. Eternal life is on the dresser, full of dust. And everything else get attention. Has it ever dawned on us that it is not normal? Has it ever dawned on us that that cannot be right? And yet we do it week after week, month after month, year after year. And we do everything. Think about it, saints of God, because I am here to shake up the things that the devil has used to captivate our minds. Because I'm showing us, I'm telling us that it is warfare. And what is being experienced by a lot of saints is warfare, spiritual warfare at the highest level that distracts us 
from the thing that would advance us in God, which is the word of God, to the extent that we cannot take up our Bible. There are folks that have not taken up their Bible in weeks and months, and I'm not asking that. There are folks that don't know to read. And I mark you, you can even listen to the word. And even that, there are folks that don't even listen to the word. And we have been saved for long. And we have reached the point where that has now become our norm. It is a trick of the enemy. And Bible studies over the next few weeks, started, that started a few weeks ago, is here to tell us that we better walk in the word. And don't let anybody fool us. We ain't going to make it. We're going nowhere if we are not lovers of the word. If we are not readers and digesters of the word. If we are not walking in the word, brothers and sisters, forget it. It is one thing to have us all in church rejoicing and singing and talking about where we are going and what's going to be happening in this local assembly and we are happy and proud to be under the tent. I hear some things about the tent sometimes and folks saying, oh, I want to come under the tent. I want to be there with you. God bless. We love that. We, we, we want you to come. But I am saying to you, saints of God, if we ever believe that coming under the tent by itself is going to be the thing that causes us to make it when the trumpet sound or advance and mature in our spiritual life just by being under the tent. I am telling you, wake up. You're sadly mistaken. I am injecting into our minds right now that without the word of God, without being immersed in the word, we are not going to make it. We are vain in our imagination and in our thoughts if we believe that we will be solid, strong, powerful Christians if we are not students of the word and if we are not walking in the word. Matters not who you are. Never can advance. Never will. And I'm going to show you how wicked Satan is. I'm going to let us see right from the very word that we don't want to read that Satan has deliberately strategized as, as, as part of the wiles of the devil. He has used some things to captivate our minds and take, he has taken control of some of our minds already. The, the battlefield of the mind, yes, the stronghold of the mind, Satan has has some of us locked because we have given up grounds and we have allowed him to step in to the extent that we can have our Bibles and don't open it and we open everything else and don't even know that something is wrong with that. And I challenge any child of God anywhere to take me up on that and to tell me that what I'm saying is not true according to the word. And we're going to go into it. But I'm saying to us, it is so important to have the word and to live in the word and to walk in the word. That if we don't, just like what happened to Israel in Exodus 32 and 33, it will happen to us, saints of God. We must align ourselves and walk with and in the word of Almighty God. I'm going to ask us to turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6 and verse 11. And I'm going to just slowly go through a series uh, of things here because I want to bring out a fact. What is it that I want to bring out? I want to bring out to us that Satan is literally doing everything to capture and to captivate the minds of the children of God. If Satan can capture your mind and divert your thinking, divert your focus, divert your attention away from the things that are contained in the word that is most important. If Satan can divert 
to the extent that we minimize the importance of the word, he would have succeeded in his deception of the people of God. And I stand here tonight and I am saying that many of us have allowed the enemy to deceive us. We have allowed Satan too much to the extent that things that were once uh, issues that you would not have even considered, that you would not have even contended with. Many Christians are now embracing some things that they once had aside because their consciousness have been captivated, their minds, the intellect have been kept. And I'm going to show us from the word, from the very root word in the scriptures, I'm going to show what those root word means to show that Satan is actually projecting himself, going one place on one road, and that place is into our minds to captivate, first of all, to capture it and to take control of it. And when we allow Satan to take control of our minds, he has us where he wants us. If he controls your mind, he then controls your emotion. He controls your health. Did you know that some people are depressed? Some people are physically sick because of the condition of their minds? How did the mind reach to that place? Some folks right now as I speak, and it is because we have yielded up grounds and territory to the devil to cause him to take over our minds. And Paul had to admonish us, and I don't want to jump. I'm going to go sequentially through it. But I'm making the point to us that we better take stock of ourselves and don't make anybody fool us. Don't make anybody tell us that it is all right as you are. It is all right. God paid the price for you already. And you just have to just go and, 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 and God has taken care of you. Of course God is taking care of, of us. Of course God has paid the price. And he has then told us, walk this way. Because I have done what I had to do. And I have therefore given you power by giving you the spirit of God. And I am requiring you to walk this particular path. You dare walk another path and, and feel that you will be all right when the Bible gives us the path in which to walk. Let us dare walk some other way. And the adversary knows that. And so he captures the mind and diverts our attention to everything else than the things that are contained in the word. And we have lost interest in the word. Many of us are in church, but we have lost interest in church. Many of us are just going through the motion. Many of us are talking about ministry, but that is just lip talk. Because there is no burning desire. And there will be no burning desire if there is not an embracing of the word and us walking in the word. Listen to how the adversary operates. And I'm coming to the scripture in Ephesians 6 and verse 11. But let me just reel to us. Because I want us to be clear in our minds how the devil strategizes to capture us and to plunder us. And while he's doing it, he makes us believe that all is well. And this is the dangerous part where we don't pray. We don't read the word. We are not saturated with the word. We don't have nothing on the inside. And we feel that everything is all right. That is the greatest deception. And that comes because we have ceded ground to the devil. And have put the word of God some other place. And now we are living in deception. And we don't even know. But I am here to awaken our consciousness through these Bible studies. I am here to touch our minds and to tell you that, and you know, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. If we don't abide in the word, we are not going to make it. I love all of you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. You love faith apostolic ministries, but if you don't love the word, you're not going to make it. This is not about men and 
deacons and pastor and choir and all of those things. This is about you. This is about me and God. You and God. At the end of the day, it is a personal salvation. And any man that don't have this word deep down in their souls and they're walking in the word, I say it another time, we are not going to make it. Look how wicked the enemy is. What he did then, he has done to the church when it just started and he's doing right now. Look in Genesis chapter number 3. Look at the episode with the temptation of Adam and Eve. In particular, when the serpent attacked Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that God spoke to the couple and said, Look here, you can eat of all the trees. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. Of this particular, don't eat from it. Because in the day, any day you dare to eat from this tree, you will surely die. You will surely die. But notice... The Bible said the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle. No man, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So, you know, questions the lady. Is that what God said? And the woman said unto the serpent, here, you know, and this is, this is what happens, you know, watch trickery, watch deception, watch the way that Satan operates. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but, verse, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Yes? And we read on. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not really die, you know. What well, God said, I'm dead. No, you're not dead. Listen to me, no man. For God know, God know, say, in the day you eat of it, any day you eat of it, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. So that God said in his word, you surely die. The adversary come now and said, look here. And that God said, no. He made it appear that you could do something else and still you are okay. And this is really what's going to happen to you. It's not that you're going to die. So he gives you something. That is so attractive. We feel that we are still doing what we were supposed to do. But we don't have to do it the way that God said it was to be done. And so she, she talked. And when he finished putting the thing together. And presenting it with his guile and his deception. And putting sugar over it and everything. Look, man, the lady, forget about the word of God because it looks so attractive based on what Satan said. What? You shall be like God. Your eye is going to be open. You're going to know good and evil. Be like the gods. You know what gods do? They create things. They establish things. You're going to be great. You're going... And at the end of the day, true trickery Satan caused Eve to doubt the word to believe the word could be changed and altered and nothing would happen and she did what she did and bam like that the word of God never is wrong 
And just as God said, you shall surely die, death came. First separation from God and physical death came into the world. Brothers and sisters, that strategy of the adversary, Satan, carried along even to this day. Even to this day, we better open up our eyes and we better be aware of it. So let me show us now, and we are going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to put this on the screen because I want us to read. And I'm going to go through some things with us because there are some things that I want us to capture. I want us to see exactly where the scripture is leading. Immediately after Ephesians 6 and verse 11, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. And we're going to show you, I really want to show us exactly the strategy, what Satan is doing and how he wants to capture our minds. Because if he does that, and the words that the Apostle Paul used makes it extremely clear to us what Satan is doing. Many of us have fallen prey because for whatever reason we have seen it grown to the extent that it is the hardest. Can I ask you a question, saints? Any of us find it difficult to, to open a Bible and, and read a chapter even when we have time? I mean, it's a struggle. And when we reach our chapter, verse 10, we say, hold on, hold on. Let me just read in the verse above it. When we read, <coughs> when we reach verse 15, we don't remember the flow of what was happening from the top. But make it was a novel. Make it was a mills and boons. And I just use an old time thing. I don't know what the new ones are. Make it was one of those little fiction book that one of those great authors had with a plot, with a scheme and showing you who is kidnapped and who has this going for them and how this one uh, take away that one friend and, uh, and, and, and we can visualize and maintain in our cranium the plot and everything and yet to read one chapter we can go three verses without losing the flow. Has that ever happened to any of us? And, and then when we must, have we ever looked and we see the corresponding scripture somewhere else that if we read it, it would have made the thing become more meaningful. But just to flip around from a scripture here to another one around here and then from one here to another, we can't bother with that and it's taking too long. I've said it before, you know, have we ever turned to a scripture and said, God, direct me, God, show me, talk to me. And we're going through something and we take up a Bible and say, God, this is you talking to me now. And just direct me, we we'll open it and we we'll place our hand there. And when we place our hand, it's one long thing. And when we turn the page, we say, but God, I don't think I got this. And, you know, we don't want to read that one because it's too long. No, no nothing for the word. Nothing for the word. We want the shortest chapter. We want the shortest verse. We want the simplest thing. No digging into the word. No searching for treasures. No searching for revelation. And yet it is in the book. And we are supposed to be saved, sanctified, going to heaven. Satan has tricked many of us. He has tricked our young people. He has tricked our middle-aged saints. He has tricked our adult saints. And we are tricked right across the spectrum into believing that we are good and we are, able to, we are going to make it even without the word. But if the word he magnifies above his name, we trample. I sit here this evening and I say, we will be in trouble with God if we continue to trample on the word. Walk in the word. We're coming down to the practical things. You know? Don't worry, man. We're, we're building up. So we're going to stay here. We're going to stick it out because I'm coming down to some things where we're going to look to see what are the practical things that are written in this word that we must run away from or we must run to, that we must embrace or that we must shun. 
But we don't want to jump into it like that without establishing the, how crucial, how important it is to see the value of the word and to embrace it and to also see that Satan, your foe, your adversary, the accuser of the brethren, as we speak, is doing every single thing to cloud our minds, to make us believe that the book is not important, to cause us not to open it, to, to lull us into sleep when it is time to read the word. As we open it, our eyes start draw. Yet we can watch TV and we can read other things and anytime we open the word and we don't realize there's something wrong with that. Brothers and sisters, something is wrong. So let us look at what Satan is doing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Turn with me. And put on. Put on the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles, W-I-L-E-S, right there that we just read, is taken from the Greek word methodos, M-E-T-H-O-D-O-S. And don't worry, the, the, the notes are being put together. You will get them. As you will, has gotten some of the others and still more to come, you will get them. But you can make your notes nevertheless, even as we go along, because we need to rehearse this. And I want us to follow clearly what I'm saying. The word wiles comes from the Greek word methodos. It is a compound of the word meta, M-E-T-A, and odos, O-D-O-S. Meta simply means with and odus simply means a road so when we put it together to get methodus m-e-t-h-o-d-o-s methodus it means with a road or on a road so that the word wiles that we see here in ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 the wiles of the devil it is the methodus of the devil and it plainly means that the enemy travels on one particular road or along one particular avenue. I want us to be clear on what I just said. So that word wiles is from the Greek word methodos. Yes? And that word methodos comes from two words. Meta and odos. And meta simply means with. W-I-T-H. With. And the word odos means a road. So when we put them back together, right, to get methodos, which is the word for wiles of the devil, it simply means with a road or on a road. So the wiles of the devil mean the road that the devil is traversing. I want us to bear that in mind. Now where does this road lead? 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. And it reads, and we are seeing it on the screen. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. Now, the word devices is again from another Greek word that is called nomata, N O E M A T A. Right? And that word comes from a word N-O-U-S, nos, right, good, that word nos is the Greek word, brothers and sisters, for 
our mind, the mind or the intellect. Most folks did not know that. It is the Greek word for mind or intellect. Now, that word, and Paul used it in the, in the scripture here in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. It carries the idea, not just of any mind, but of a deceived mind. So here he was saying, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. So based on what was said, lest he should get an advantage, lest he should deceive us. There is something about what is in the scripture that the mind that he is talking about. That word knows, that means mind. Just by what he said in the scripture here, he was referring to a mind that has been deceived. And it is important that we capture that. So it depicts the insidious, wicked plot and scheme of Satan to attack and victimize, victimize the mind of a person. And that's why the Apostle Paul, do you remember the scripture in the same Second Corinthians where Paul said to them, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So it, that scripture Paul uses because of what he knows is happening. Casting down, and I have it on the screen for us, casting down imaginations and Every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. So Paul is talking to the Corinthians again and he's saying to them, look here, be careful of the things that come into your imagination. You're going to have to cast them down. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and here's what you're going to have to do, saints. Paul is talking to the saints at Corinth, you know, And he's saying you're going to have to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Why will you have to bring the thoughts into captivity? Because here is the strategy. What Satan uses every time. He knows that whoever controls a person's mind also controls that person's health, as I said before, is emotion, yes, he, he controls the person's life, so to speak, because depending on what is planted in the mind and depending on what we receive and hold on to, it has implication for every area of our lives. It can affect us emotionally it can affect us mentally it can affect us spiritually satan knows this so based on the scripture that we read in ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 the methods be, be careful that we stand against the wiles of the devil yes and we say that word wiles is taken from the greek word methodos and it simply means on a particular road or with a particular road. Make note of that. Then we moved over to 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. And that last part of that scripture said, For we are not ignorant of his devices. And the word devices is from a Greek word, no matter, N-O-E-M-A-T-A. Which also comes from another Greek word, nos, N-O-U-S. And that word simply means the mind. So what is being said here is that Satan operates on a particular road. And that road, where does it lead? It leads to the mind. Brothers and sisters, as I stand or as I sit before you, I am submitting to you. That Satan doesn't have a whole lot of tricks. 
Yes, he does things differently, but it all is coming along one road and there is one place that it is heading and he is doing everything to captivate the mind of the believer. And he knows that if he can capture the mind, if he can captivate the mind, if he can co co conquer the intellect, he knows that he has that individual. And I sit here this evening to tell some saint that we have sat back for too long and have allowed Satan to bypass and come with his devices and capture us. Whereas Paul was saying we should not be ignorant of his devices because we don't read the word, because we don't have the word, because we don't embrace the word. We have allowed Satan to capture our mind. When Paul wrote that scripture and he later on came again with the scripture um, to in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, casting down imagination, he's saying that, look, this is where the enemy is attacking. He's on a road and he's constantly traversing that road and that road leads to our minds. So Paul said, because I know that it leads to your mind, because I know that if he capture your mind, he's going to cause you to think all kind of unholy, ungodly, wicked things. He's going to cause you to think evil things. He's going to cause you to hate your brothers. And he's going to cause you to imagine all kind of wicked devices. So Paul is saying to do a same Corinthian church who is telling that he's after your mind. He's saying, listen to me, cast down imaginations. Those things that come to your mind, don't make them reside there. Mash them down. Every I think that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, mash it down, cast it down. Don't make it take root in your mind. Because if it takes root in your mind, you are going to find that you have no desire for the word. You have no desire to walk in the word. And if you have no desire for the word, you are not going to walk in the word. And if we don't walk in the word, we are going to walk contrary and that is a fact. And it is therefore crucial that we understand that. So he, he comes along a certain road with his trickery. Yes. He comes along a certain road um, with his cunning. He comes along a certain road with his craftiness. But whatever cunning devices, whatever craft he's coming with, whatever subtleness he's going to come with, whatever trickery he's going to use, he's on a road. And that road is leading, brothers and sisters, to our minds. And if he captures the mind, he conquers the person. Because, brothers and sisters, the battlefield, a big part of our warfare is in the minds of saints. And that's why we can think about everything else because he injects these things into our minds. He injects wicked thoughts. He injects evil things to the extent that if they captivate the mind, there is no space left for us to be thinking on things that are good and to be thinking on things that are wonderful and to think on and meditate on and in the word of God. If we find that we are not reading the word, if we, are, if we find that we are not studying the word, if we find that we are not interested in the word, it means, brothers and sisters, that somewhere along the line, we have given up so much ground that even the desire for the word we have lost and if we are at that place, I dare say that we are at a bad, bad place. And that is a problem. Yes? And after, after the adversary do that, establish the road and he establish by what means he's going to come to you, he then hits that road hits that highway, if, if we may use that term, and then he comes over to you, he then gets into your mind. After he conquers the mind, 
there is a third thing that happens. It leads to what is called deception. This is where the person believe all the lies that Satan is projecting and injecting into the mind of the child of God. Yes, this is why, have you ever noticed, many marriages fail because of false allegations that the enemy tried to pound into the mind of each spouse. You know that sometimes the simple things are there, but one party think a particular thing and oh can my wife be so wicked to do this and to do that and then the enemy put it into the mind of the husband how can my husband think to do this and and then you know that sometimes the very thing that we think our husband was thinking or the thing that we think our wife was thinking we start to take action watch me and him watch me and her and all that happened you know is that we misread something and who is behind that because it's a mind game and it is the adversary that is behind that and in that mind game we start to take action based on some things that we conceived because we might have heard something somebody might have and listen and this is why when we get to the practical thing I am going to show us how wicked the Bible describes some people you see people that engage in gossip you see people that engage in slander, we're coming, you know, I'm just setting the pace and establishing the, why we need to know where we are. Because there are some things that people say that, let us say, for example, somebody's talking about somebody's husband or somebody's wife and the person hear it and think that their husband or their wife did this it came out of some gossip or some slander the husband or the wife registered it in their mind and then it starts to go through and circulate and percolate in their minds that's exactly what happens and then before we know it you know before we know it the couple start to think this of each other. And as long as the couple repel these allegations, the devil's lie exert no power in the marriage. But if they don't repel it, and they cause the thing to resonate in the mind, and cause the thing to take root, then bitterness is going to grow and there's going to be a wedge between that husband and wife. And brothers and sisters, it is all happening in the mind because the seed was planted in the mind first and we did not pick it up. And that is the strategy that the adversary used. Many marriages have dissipated today because of something that started in the mind. And the saints of God feel to recognize that they must take control of their minds. This is the strategy of the enemy. They fail to recognize, saints fail to recognize that we are in warfare. Saints fail to recognize that we are fighting a dangerous foe. Saints fail to recognize that he is doing this and there are some things that he injects into our minds just to test us and to see if we're going to hug it up. And guess what? Saints hug it up. And by hugging it up and make it take nest in our mind and start to cultivate, we will have a big problem. Paul knows what this can do the apostle knows what can be the end result of our hugging up these imaginations and these thoughts that the adversary tried to inject in our mind so he said cast them down push them out kill them bring them under subjection do it quickly brothers and sisters because if we don't then we are going to fall into the trap of the enemy and we are going to become a victim. If we are going to walk in the word, we are going to have to recognize that we are in warfare. We are in spiritual warfare. 
and many of the Christians, many young people, many middle-aged, many of our elderly saints think we are in a little dolly house thing and in a little patty shop thing. And we are not. This is the church of the living God. And we serve a real God. And there is a real devil looking to stop you on your journey, on our journey. And we fail to recognize and we just live. The adversary will inject it into our minds. Paul warns us, you know, and says some things I wanted to stay away from. I just jump in the gun a little. He says, stay away from revelings. Stay away from lasciviousness. Stay away from certain things. It's in the word. But because we don't read the word, we don't even know that these things are there. What is reveling? What is lasciviousness? We come into these when we start, start going to the practical walk in the word, you know. Well, that's where we're going. But I'm, I'm setting the pace again. Saying because we don't read it, we don't know it, we don't even realize that there are some things that we must avoid. So we just run gone into them. We just run doing some things. Only to find that we are becoming weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Be careful. After his wiles, then his devices comes. After the devices then the deception and the deception is where everything comes to an utter collapse the deception phase is where everything the tire the rubber meets the road this is what you know the bible tells us in i believe it is first samuel's chapter 17 and i am going to just if we could find that, 1 Samuel chapter 17. The, this is how Satan operates. Don't lose sight of it. Never lose sight of how he operates. It happened like that from, we just read Genesis 3, and see where God gave his word, and Satan tried to turn it around. Then when we come to 1 Samuel, the Bible gives us a, an episode with David and Goliath and it, the soldiers of Israel. And it is important that we can see how Satan, uh, it, it, it don't change his strategy. And yet he just catches us off guard every time because we are not careful. And we are not careful because we are unaware. And we are unaware because we are not in the word. And I am challenging the people of God. Love the word. Stay in the word. Walk in the word. So 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at, and we are at verse 1, which be, at, at Shokoth, where was that? Which belongeth to, that's 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's, it's off the screen. I really want us to follow. So what was happening? What was happening now the Philistines gather together and it's up their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokoth, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokoth and Azek Aska in Epsadamin. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battling array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Right? There was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. That's nine feet, nine inches. Call that roughly ten feet high. No basketball I know as tall as that. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I wasn't going to how much pound that weigh, like a hundred pounds. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. I mean, the total amount of weight between his sword and all the 
armor that he had on in was about 800 pounds, you know, brothers and sisters. So you must know the size of this man and how thick and heavy he was to bear 800 pounds and able to walk around and lift a sword and, and lift a shield and all of those things. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bear bearing a shekel went before, a shield, sorry, went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, said, stand up and shout and said unto them, why are you come? Out to set your battle in array. I'm not I a Philistine and you servants of Saul. Choose your man for you and let him come down to me. Follow me, saints. Because we're going to wrap it up with this. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and servants. Hold on, don't move that one. I want us to take note of verse 9 here, you know. This is the nature of the battle. When we and the adversary are in conflict, he hates you, son of God. He hates you, daughter of the Most High, and he wants to kill you. And you better hate him too. And our objective must be to kill him. And we must fight with the view that we're going to either stamp him or he's going to stamp us. And hear what the scripture in verse 9 is saying. If, I, if you kill me, the Philistines will be your servant. Yes? Or if, and if I kill you, you are going to become my servant. If he gets the upper hand, we are going to be his servants. But if we, saints of God, keep the upper hand and keep him up at bay, he must be our servant. What has happened is that we have relinquished our position and we have caused ourselves to be servants of the adversary. This is what is happening in verse 9 here. This is the nature of the battle even to this day. Whoever wins, the other become their servant. And we don't realize that. This is word, you know, word we're talking about. This is word that we must walk in, you know, saints of God. For these are scriptures given for our admonition. This is word and this is the nature of the battle. And whoever get the upper hand, the other one become their servant. This is why many of us don't even realize that we are literally servants of Satan right now. Because we have given up where the battle is concerned. And he has the upper hand. And therefore we are always on the seemingly on the losing side. We are servants. We have given up the battle. And have therefore become servants to the adversary. That's the nature of the, of, the, of the battle. But here verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. So he's no bragging. He's no doing something. He's no getting into their mind. Now listen to what happens in verse 11. Key scripture, saints of God. Word again. When Saul and all Israel heard... These words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were stunned. They were numbed. That's what this may mean. They became incapacitated. They, 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 Goliath immobilized them totally. And listen. Goliath never lift a sword yet, you know. Goliath never lick a man yet. He never, he never swing the sword yet. He never kill once. All that he did was talk. And they heard it. And it registered in their minds. And they were dismayed. They were greatly afraid. They were immobilized by the words alone. Brothers and sisters, I submit to us that the adversary is going to inject words, is going to inject things into our thoughts, and many of us, many of us are going to be immobilized because of the things that we hear or the things that we are experiencing, that we experiencing, that we see coming from the hands of the adversary. Many folks need to understand saints of God we need to understand that Satan don't have to lift a straw the adversary does not have to lift a straw 
all he needs to do based on what we saw in Ephesians 6 verse 11, based on what we read in, in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, based on what we read in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. It is important that we see the sequence in coming along a particular road and his aim and objective at the end of that road is to enter into our mental field, the field of the mind. And if he captures the mind, he then pushes his agenda right from the mind. And thereafter, from the mind, he then moves into the phase of deception. And that's why we have to be careful how we speak. When the Bible warns us not to slander, it's because that word will go into the mind of another saint who will process it and it will resonate in the mind. And that person who don't know somebody you know, can hear something from a saint. You, did you know that a saint can poison a person? Poison a person against another saint who don't even know that individual. And they just hate the person. And you say, why you hate the person? Boy, I don't know, you know. But when I just come to church, I didn't hear this about the person. Somebody, they tell me this, or a group of people, they tell me this. And say, stay far from that one because this and this. And I just develop a hatred for the person. What it is weak. We are going to talk about the practical things in a virgin. We are going to show you why some folks don't know where you're going. We are going to show you from scripture, the practicality of scripture. The Bible said that some folks in the church, your religion is vain comes vain because of some things that we do. The fact that we don't even know that we are doing those things because we're not in the word. We don't even know some of the things that are wrong and we are here thinking that we're doing the right thing. Anybody that goes to an individual and packs their mind so that the thing comes in and resonates and stay there and then they see it and use it and it causes discord, it causes hatred, it causes, causes variance, it causes all kind of things. Not only the person who developed the hatred is going to be in trouble, you know, but the one that sowed the seed. And the Bible says that person's religion is vain. So it don't matter how much you're in and you're, we're, we're jumping and we're shouting and we're preaching and we're teaching and we're singing and we're clapping. The religion that you are purporting is vain if certain things that are contained in the word you fail to live by. But we don't reach there, so we're coming to that. So we're coming back now for us to understand that here it is in Scripture, 1 Samuel 17, verse 11, Satan never have to live a straw. Satan not going to come chop anybody and, and push a sword through anybody. He can't do that. Not to our physical body. He doesn't have the leeway. Unless we own all kind of door and him work through somebody and, and get to us. But he doesn't have that leeway. So what he uses is his wiles, is his devices, is the strategies that are available to him. And that is to work in the realm that we are not seeing and captivate the mind. Every time that we think an evil thought and, and every time that we strategize as to how we can do this to bring down that one and to pull down that one and watch you are going to get that one and watch you are going look here this is the devil at work and that is all he needs to do to make some people tremble and he did not utter a word in, well he did not lift a sword sorry all he did was open his mouth and say watch what I'm going to do to honor today Watch how we're going mashing it down. And the people of God, the soldiers of Israel, were greatly dismayed and they were greatly afraid. Same strategy he uses. Use somebody to say a word. Use something to inject into your mind. You, but if we ever allow it to go into our minds and then to percolate and then to sickle, then right there and then we have lost out and satan is going to have his way in our lives don't let the enemy the adversary intimidate you if we find that we can't open the bible if we find that we don't have no desire for the word if we find that we can't turn the page and consistently read you if we find that we can't put the the, the, the earplug over our ears and listen to some scriptures for a whole book 
sometimes just so because it, it, it goes off so quick when we listen and we can't do that but we can listen to 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 r kelly for days and end and we listen to everything else and we read everything else we have allowed the adversary to get a hold of us and we better break out of that because whoever wins that warfare you and i become servant if we allow satan to capture us in that way we better capture him and cause him to flee from us by casting down imagination and to bring into captivity every thought of the mind and take control of our hearts and our minds so that the things that are good and lovely and pure and of good report we can think on these things so that we can exalt god and we can be free to open the book and to get into the word and to magnify God. Brothers and sisters, if we do not abide and walk in the word, we are not going to make it. I say this to myself. I say this to every member of faith chapel and the other churches in the faith apostolic ministries i said this to every saint whichever organization you're from it doesn't matter i said this to the saints in jamaica i said to the saints in america i said to the saints in canada i said to the saints in the uk i said to the saints in germany i said to the saints in the bahamas i said wherever you are watching and listening i would better get this word we better go through slowly and get this word because this is life. This is life. This is reality. We need to appreciate that and understand that and live in the word. When we get back, we still have some more to go here because we are going to talk about the word in terms of Paul puts it in another scripture that the word is the sword of the spirit. And we are going to see it is not the sword that is a defensive sword that blocks. We are going to see that the word that he used to define or describe the sword of the spirit is one that has two edges. It was an offensive sword that you use now to juke and use a dagger and chop off and cut off and turn into the enemy. And the only way we can use that sword is if we have the word because he described the word as that two-edged sword which the Roman soldiers used. And we're going to look at that when we meet again to make us understand, to cause us to understand that without the word, we don't have the ability to go on the offensive and to take territories and to conquer for Jesus and to be overcomers. The absence of this word will cause us to die slowly as many saints are dying, but we're not going to make that happen in Jesus' name. We're going to get it right. We're going to put it in perspective. We're going to cause us to have a love for the word again, and we will be overcomers, and we are going to make it. God bless you. We stop at this time, and we pick up next week in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can we bow our heads? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your great presence again. Thank you, mighty God, for what you have been doing in the lives of your people. I thank you for your saints. There is a desire for you. There is a desire for the word. But we have so many of us allowed the adversary to step into the battlefield of the mind. And God caused us to drop our swords and to lie down as dead. Let that not be the case. Help us to arise, almighty God, and fight again because you have won the victory already. And we must just do our part and walk in the spirit and love the word and fight until we die. Give us the energy. Give us the strength. Grant unto us the power again and help us, O oh God. If there is nothing else that we have, help us to have a strong desire first for you and for your word more than anything else oh god help us in this regard bless your people that are tuned in at this time every one of us help us to love your words help us to love you almighty god help us to introspect at this time and to make the moves and to do the things that 
are to be done so that we can be at the place that we should be. Help us, mighty God. We cannot do it of ourselves. We cannot do it in our flesh. It has to be by the help of Almighty God. And we seek your help right now. Strengthen your people. Bless us together. Bless us abundantly. Let your name be glorified, great God. We give you thanks. We magnify you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. The Lord bless you, saints of the Most High God. Thank you for tuning in again. Remember, Sunday, uh, we are going to have group four. It will be the last of the one group per Sunday. After this Sunday, when it is group four, the other Sunday, we are going to have group one at nine o'clock and group two at 11.30. Bear it in mind. We want to try to see how, as best as possible, how we can have the saints rotating every other week. And I am sure we will all be happy for that. The Lord bless you. Um, God's willing, next week, same time, same place. Uh, let's worship the Lord together. He is worthy to be praised. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.